Our next speaker is District Attorney of New York County, Cy Vance. Vance became Manhattan DA in 2010 and established his office as a leader in the fight against cybercrime. He's here today to talk to us about the cross-border and cross-sector partnerships that his office is employing to combat cybercrime. Please welcome Manhattan DA, Cy Vance. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me, Bloomberg Law. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to a, uh, a great audience and uh, uh, of great lawyers. And uh, I'm really very interested uh, in your questions uh, after I finish speaking so that I can address some of the things that are on your mind. Uh, this is a, uh, a gathering of people who are focused on innovation as Bloomberg is focused on innovation. And uh, I share the same need for uh, innovation in my office uh, of 600 lawyers handling 100,000 cases a year as you do in your law firms with the intense speed and variety and complexity of the matters uh, that you face. But nowhere is this need uh, for innovation any more important than in the area of uh, taking on the cyber threat that we have today, whether you're in private business or you're in government. Now, it's often said, and it's a phenomenal thing, and I want you to remember that New York is the safest big city in America. Uh, that's largely because of the enormously powerful work that's been done over the last decades in dealing with violent crime, rapes, homicides, robberies, and the like. But in economic crime, however, uh, we are in New York, and particularly in New York County, Manhattan, uh, very, very much at risk. Because despite all of the public safety gains that we have acquired uh, in contemporary New York, uh, in my view, in this one prosecutor's view, uh, cybercrime, second only to terrorism, is our biggest threat. Our threat for the security of our city and our, the biggest threat in terms of the potential to interrupt and affect our individual lives. Now, nowhere is this more true in America than in Manhattan because we are the center of finance. Uh, we are the center uh, of the legal profession in terms of the uh, overwhelming number of lawyers uh, and firms that have come to consolidate here. Uh, New York really is, uh, for the United States, the economic center of our, our lives. Uh, and in this environment, economic crime and cybercrime is a particularly dangerous combination. But dealing with cybercrime as a prosecutor is, is really relatively new. Uh, when I was a young assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office in the 80s, Computer crime was when someone stole someone's computer. Uh, how different it is today uh, where a single act of uh, computer theft or computer data theft can affect millions of individuals and their personal identifying information. Now, I could talk a long time, uh, but I'm not going to, about the prosecutions that our office has done over the last six years uh, against international cyber criminals and organizations, domestic uh, cyber criminals and organizations, and the interesting evolution of street crime to cyber crime. And that the gangs in New York City, many of them teenagers or folks under 20, uh, are actually uh, much more involved now. They've moved away from other criminal activities that are more dangerous and moved into the area of identity theft and cyber crime it's less risky, and it's more remunerative. One of the problems that we face and that you face in taking on cybercrime is it evolves so quickly. So in 2014 and 2015, there were a number of uh, incredibly sophisticated and powerfully uh, successful uh, incursions and intrusions on uh, valuable data. You've all heard of the uh, uh, cyber attack on the U.S. United States Office of personnel and management that stole four million uh, bits, pieces of, or, or, or identities of four million federal employees and 18 million others. And I was one of those 18 million others because my security clearance and all the information about my family was in that same database. Uh, and so we all heard about that and it had a big impact. And however, uh, the cyber criminals moved and evolved very quickly. Target and these large 
box stores. You all have heard about how they have become uh, the victim of massive incursions and thefts of data. And it's evolved again today, and many of your clients uh, or the firms or the businesses in which you are general counsel are being subject to business email compromise schemes, which is unbelievably where someone pretends they're the CFO or the CEO, sends an email to someone who has the capacity to write big checks, and they get an email and think actually they're being directed to move a million dollars here, move a million dollars there, and they do, but in fact, uh, it's a fraud. All that said, uh, the work in prosecuting cybercrime and how we've been able to do some things very successful, I think really lays bare the limits of the traditional prosecution approaches to cybercrime. And why is that? First and foremost, cybercrime is international. Economic crime is international. Traditional borders and boundaries that used to define where crimes were committed and who were going to be the victims are irrelevant. What was the crime scene in my young days as a DA? The street corner where someone was shot or stabbed and the yellow tape that put that crime scene away from the public, that's gone. It's been replaced by the internet as our 21st century crime scene. All around us, we are living in a world in which identity thieves and cyber criminals are operating often with impunity. I had the opportunity some time ago recognizing the international nature of cybercrime to sit down with the chief of the city of police for the city of London. And the city of London is not metropolitan London. The city of London is that square mile in the city of London, big city of London, uh, which was the ancient city of London. And it has its own commissioner of, of her police. But importantly, that commissioner is responsible for all the economic crime investigations and cybercrime investigations for the entire UK. So that commissioner has a very important role to play in fighting cybercrime, identifying cybercrime in the UK. And we realized as we talked with each other, and this was several, several years ago, that there was a real commonality uh, that we ought to take advantage of between our two offices. The same white collar thieves that were hitting London were hitting New York. The same cyber criminals who are attacking London businesses are attacking our businesses here in the United States. And so our partnership developed and we decided to second personnel us to London, them to us, to investigate jointly uh, those criminal actors who were, we believed, operating in the UK and in London. And we built a number of successful prosecutions of securities fraud and other more traditional frauds as a result of that. But could I borrow a glass of water from somebody or just, thanks. What we both started to realize is something very simple. I can prosecute cyber criminals until the cows come home. And we're gonna continue to do that until the cows come home. But the level of cyber crime and threat is rising like this. And I simply cannot, nor can governments anywhere, prosecute enough cyber criminals, in my opinion, to bend that line. So, what are our options? What we decided to do with the City of London is to approach this differently. Uh, Cybercrime is the following. It is international. Uh, every country is a threat, is, has, is a threat and probably has and is threatened. Uh, institutions in every country in the world or is threatened. But what doesn't exist today is an understanding in my view that as a world community, we have to approach cybercrime collectively. Uh, the Manhattan DA's office obviously can only do so much by itself in identify identifying cyber criminals and prosecuting them. But when the Manhattan DA's office put, 
teams up with the City of London Police and other agencies around the world, federal agencies as well, we become more effective. But in the business world and the world of governments, while you have a number of organizations that share information about cyber threats in the economic space, for example, what you don't have is what I think cybercrime calls for to fight it, which is a cross-sector sharing of information. Transportation to aerospace, aerospace to banking, banking to health and hospitals, health and hospitals to municipalities, municipalities to the big, uh, the big financial institutions that are here and elsewhere. There is not a shared, uh, an approach, shared approach to cybercrime prevention between all these important governments and, in, and entities around the world. And the consequence is that we are fighting cybercrime individually, sometimes in groups, but we are really not taking a world view on how to address this increased cyber threat. So I think we can all start with the premise that if I could prevent a 16-year-old kid getting a gun in his hand and shooting someone on a street in Manhattan, I'd much rather prevent that crime than I would prosecute it. I think the same thing applies to economic crime and also now particularly to cybercrime. We're not gonna bend the curve of cybercrime by prosecuting individual actors, whether they're from Eastern Europe or Latin America or Asia. But we can, we believe, bend the curve if we collectively focus on prevention efforts and share information about successful prevention technology internationally, across sectors, across governments. So last year, uh, the City of London Police Commissioner, myself, and a group called the, the Center for Internet Security, Security excuse me, in Washington, D.C., uh, decided that we were going to try to develop just such an entity, an international collaboration inviting many sectors to participate across many borders. So we created a not-for-profit, which is called the Global Cyber Alliance. Our offices here in New York are based at Bloomberg. Thank you, Bloomberg. Uh, our offices in London are based at the City of London Police, and our, our office, uh, additionally an office in DC. And I expect that we will actually try to position ourselves with another office on the continent and ultimately uh, in the east. Today, we have some six months after we announced the formation of it when Director Comey was speaking at an annual cyber conference that we host each year at the Fed. Uh, we have 64 organizations uh, here and elsewhere in the world that are participating in the Cyber Alliance. And it's a pretty impressive group. Microsoft, Citibank, RSA, Lockheed Martin, financial institutions, computer, security companies, uh, municipalities, the city of New York, and uh, the French prosecutor's office in Paris. And I really encourage you, if you're interested, we have to hand out here sort of a short description of what this organization is and who are the participating members. And I urge you, if you're interested, to take a look at it. Because what was amazing to me is when we started to go out and talk about what we we're creating, there was an immediate sense of, that makes sense. Now, this is not a government organization. This is a not-for-profit. And I recognize uh, that uh, there, may, there may be uh, those who are uncomfortable or are concerned about a prosecutor's office uh, participating in this way or them with the prosecutor's office. But uh, our focus uh, is really not on prosecution, but our focus is on gathering together uh, businesses, governments, and, and others who are interested in working collaboratively. So uh, I'm also pleased to announce outside our businesses that uh, we've had our first law firm join the Global Cyber Alliance, and it's a little 900-person per shop here in New York called Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. Uh, and so we are delighted that they have uh, decided uh, from the big law point of view uh, that there is a value in their understanding of the best ways to 
minimize cyber attacks for themselves and their clients uh, through participating in this collaborative. Now, the threats that I'm talking about are, are not secret or well known, or not what they are well known. The biggest threat that we face uh, in terms of cyber attacks comes from phishing. That's simple, but that's how uh, an enormous amount of cyber crime uh, occurs and how malware is introduced in businesses and law firms and governments around the world. Uh, there is vulnerability related to weak identity and, ident and authentication mechanisms in our businesses and our uh, municipal governments. There are risks associated with going to and logging into unsecured websites around the world. And you're all familiar with the risks and problems that come from distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. Now, some of these are relatively mundane, and most of them are known to you. But the reality is that while individuals, individual companies have found ways to try to mitigate the risk in those areas, there hasn't been a sharing of that information of what works best across sectors, as I said, transportation to health and hospitals, and across borders, the Manhattan DA's office to the City of London Police Commissioner. But when, when you do uh, have that kind of collaboration, then we are able to accomplish a much broader impact in reducing the number of cyber attacks among our collective members. Now, the first area that we've decided to focus on is on phishing. And what we've done is we've assembled a technical advisory board of some phenomenally smart uh, technicians and cyber experts who are advising the strategic advisory board on which I sit about what our next effort should be. And our first attempt and our first attack is going to be on, on phishing. And we are developing the toolkit uh, that we are working very closely with Aetna, who has done an amazing job on, uh, on developing preventative uh, software to minimize uh, intrusions in their company, uh, working with them and others to develop the best technology and to share that technology with all our members. And in the intervening months between now and the end of year, introduce it into some target companies, measure the impact, and uh, understand what level of reduction in cybercrime we're going to be able uh, to achieve. We hope it's going to be significant, and then share that information throughout the Alliance here, elsewhere around the world, sector to sector. Now, I just want to emphasize from my perspective and others uh, who have been in government here, uh, this is a threat that if we don't collectively deal with it, uh, we are going to collectively be overwhelmed by it. Uh, I don't think we can under or overstate, in my opinion, uh, the risks and the downstream negative consequences that are facing us unless we as a global community, as a worldwide business community, and a worldwide community of governments start to approach these problems together. This isn't a possessory. We're not, we're not creating something that we are holding back. We are trying to flip things on their head. We're trying to create the best practices, share them widely to as many organizations as possible in order to increase the minimization of successful cyber attacks around the country. Now, how are we paying for this? I'm paying for it. Uh, the Manhattan DA's office, uh, working with our federal partners, uh, has been able to collect forfeiture uh, dollars in some large cases in which we prosecuted and investigations we've conducted. And I've de deemed uh, it the right thing to do for our office to commit $25 million over the course of five years to the Global Cyber Alliance in order for us to have the runway uh, to get this up operating and the gas in the tank uh, to make sure that it's able to launch successfully. And at some point, we'll no longer be involved in this. It will have taken off on its own and we will simply have been the catalyst or a catalyst to get this started. And then the companies like Microsoft or Aetna or Citi and others, uh, they will be managing this on their own collectively uh, and uh, cooperatively. And, and we just had our first strategic advisory meeting, meeting at the New York Fed, which is a member of the Global Cyber Alliance, uh, earlier this year. And it's a remarkable thing to be in the room with cross-sector, cross-border, cross-government representatives all talking about how we can share information, not personal identifying information, not client information, but attack data 
uh, and uh, share solu technical solutions that will benefit all of us and not be possessive to any one of us. Uh, so I encourage all of you, if this is of interest to you, uh, to talk to Ken Kern, who's sitting in the corner over there. And he has uh, uh, the information on one sheet that I think will tell you who's involved, uh, what's the goal. And uh, it's straightforward, simple. And you can make your own mind up as to whether or not this is something that might be useful either for your business, where you're the GC, or for your law firm in terms of being, making sure that the best technologies that are being created by a collaboration of the biggest and best businesses in order to fight identity theft and cybercrime and prevent cybercrime is being shared and you might find value in also sharing that. So I'd like to end and take questions after just talking about one other issue uh, that uh, is a real concern to me and I think should be to all of us. Um, and uh, it relates to the issue of uh, cyber related, uh, but in a different way, it relates to the issue of encryption of our cell phones and the uh, decision by the two largest manufacturers of smartphones and operating systems, Apple and Google, in 2014 to re-engineer their devices so that those devices would no longer to be, be able to be opened with a digital key by the companies that created the phones or the software. Um, and therefore, creating what are the first warrant-proof devices that I know of uh, in, uh, in our country's history and in uh, probably the history around the world. Now, whether the factor, whether the motivating concern for their actions was uh, privacy or, as I suspect, to maintain market share in the worldwide sales of smartphones, the effect of the matter, the effect of this is that uh, there is going to be, and there are real consequences occurring every day as a result of law enforcement not being able to access the phones when a judge independently is determined that there is likely to be evidence of a crime on that phone. It's a particular concern to me because we've all read about this in the last year or so and looked at it through the lens of federal law enforcement and terrorism. Hugely important. Our office is uh, involved in terrorism investigations and I don't minimize any of that. But the much bigger impact of full default device encryption as it's called is going to be felt by people like me running agencies in cities like New York. Because 95% of the crime that is prosecuted around the country is prosecuted, it occurs in local, in local jurisdictions. So we're not talking about terrorism, we're talking about our neighbors, our families, our friends, our federal city residents who are victimized in cases involving homicide, rape, robbery, child abuse, economic theft, and the like. So the biggest impact of our inability to access devices is gonna be felt actually at the local level. In our office now, since the inception of uh, default device encryption in September of 2014, we now have 270 devices, Apple devices, uh, that we cannot open, even though a judge has issued a search warrant to give us access to those devices. And we can't open them because Apple, in 2014, re-engineered the devices so that they could no longer operate them. Now, there's a, wide varain, there's a wide variety of opinion on this, and, uh, and I understand that there has been a lot of concern about government overreach, uh, and I understand that uh, the case involving Edward Snowden represents a lot of that concern. But I want to tell you first and foremost, uh, that's not really applicable to state law enforcement, because we have to get a search warrant based upon probable cause and present it to a neutral judge to get into any device that we seize. So this is not a situation where state prosecutors are running amok. It's a situation where state prosecutors have proven their preliminary case to a judge. The judge has said, I agree, there is likely to be evidence of a crime on this phone, but now we can no longer access it. So why is that so important? Now, Tim Cook, when he issued a very 
you know, a powerful letter to his customers uh, on the eve of the litig litigation in San Bernardino, which I'm sure you all know about, um, he, he made the statement that's absolutely true. Apple changed the world. Google probably thinks they changed the world too. But Apple changed the world. And we all now live our lives on our cell phones. Right? We don't keep the old diaries we used to keep. We don't work off paper like we used to. Um, we live in a digital age and we operate by without, with our access to stored uh, digital communications. This is exactly the same for criminals. They're no different than you or me. Criminals call each other about committing crimes. They send photographs either of the proceeds of crimes or locations that they want to hit to each other. And on and on and on. So what we need to understand, the consequence of not being able to get into cell phones, even with a court order, is that criminals uh, have a warrant-proof device. And that, as I said, is having consequences that are real around the country. In my office, 270 cases. Uh, in other communities, hundreds more in California. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, there's a mother whose daughter was murdered when she opened the door uh, in her home. Uh, no one saw the assailant who killed her, but we know that she was texting right before she died and was shot uh, in front of her daughter inside the house. She died. The, she was carrying a baby eight months. That baby died six days later. And we can't get into the phone. I say we because this is, in fact, a collaborative, it's a collaborative effort. We're working with government officials in all states trying to get solutions to these. Now, using that case, that tragic case as an example, here's my question to you. Who gets to decide where to draw the line between privacy and public safety? Who makes that decision? We know looking backwards that banks were very resistant, I'm sure, to providing certain information to the government, but they understood, after we understood that criminals move money through banks and cash, that we should create currency transaction reports. And those reports should identify and file information about movements of large amounts of cash. In 1994, uh, where, when Kalia was created, uh, the telephone companies weren't volunteering, didn't want to give government access to the phone lines so that the government could tap into a conversation. But ultimately, Congress understood that, because like we understand, criminals were using the phones to commit crimes. And the telephone companies were required to provide an access point to law enforcement. So when a law, law enforcement agency went to court, got a wiretap affidavit, presented to the court, and got an order, we could access those phones. When companies get so big, and the products that they develop are so ubiquitous, that they are really part of our everyday, everyday life, Looking backwards, businesses have understood there is a responsibility to work collaboratively with law enforcement to solve crimes in medium where we know crimes are being committed. And we know that criminals are using smartphones to commit crimes, to store communication about crimes, to text each other about crimes. But two companies that collectively own 96.7% of the world's smartphones, operating systems, have decided they know where the line between privacy and public safety should be drawn. Now, my question to you is, is that, is that right? The consequence of our inability to access phones is mounting daily. What happened in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and cases like that are occurring around the country, and I want to raise this with you because wherever, whatever you feel about the issue, and people feel powerfully, I understand, about it one way or the other, uh, at the end of the day, I don't think this is a decision that these two companies get to make. Uh, I think it's a decision that has to be made by Congress uh, that are not themselves makers and sellers of smartphones, that they have no motivation other than to sort this problem out. Their, uh, their obligation is not to increase market share for their customers and make more money for the shareholders. So what I hope I left you with is that the cyber world that we live in uh, is increasingly complicated. Uh, the threats are increasingly serious. Uh, I believe that we need to change the way we approach uh, attacking cybercrime from simply a prosecutive mode to a preventative one. 
that prevention will succeed to the greatest degree when we collaborate across sectors and across borders. And until we understand, in my opinion, that that's a more powerful way to minimize the damage that can occur through cybercrime, uh, prosecutors will be doing a great job in various jurisdictions, uh, but the impact of those cases uh, are not going to be enough to bend that curve and in a real measurable sense, make millions of people safer uh, simply by taking off dozens and dozens of bad actors and gangs around the world. So thank you for letting me speak, and I don't know if there's time to talk, uh, time to take questions, but I'll leave that to you.